Professor Wang Hui just explained to us his perspectives on China's uh, economic and political and social emergence. Uh, now, uh, I would like to ask a few questions because I know him very well, and uh, also I know our students very well, so I believe I can be a bridge to bring together his knowledge to your questions. So my first question is, how can you compare the Communist Party and a Communist Party in the former Soviet Union or in, former so in Eastern European countries? What's the difference? It seems to us that the Chinese Communist Party is so much more robust than their counterparts in Eastern Europe. Why? Yeah, the first, uh, Chinese Communist Party, you know, it was founded in 1921. At that time, this party was founded by Comintern. It's international. So it's not, the, it's, it's, which means that the Communist Party, at the beginning, it was founded by the foreigners from Russia, from Dutch, and some even from India. Those representatives come to China, help Chinese to found it, the Communist Party. But this Communist Party was very different from the Communist Party afterwards, from my point of view. Of course, there were continuities. Basically, in short term, is like a Mao Zedong's Communist Party. It was reshaped during the People's War. It was Civil War. I use the term People's War. Why I use the People's War? Because the People's War, by definition, is not only a military war. It was a long, quite a profound social transformation. Because the war arm struggle, together with the land reform, together with huge mobilization of the peasants, and the restructure of the countryside, the whole social structure transformed of that. So the early Soviet in the poor area in Jiangxi, and then in Shanxi, and those areas were the result of the so-called People's War. We could, um, this is one, with, this is a huge social mobilization. Now, in contrast, what happened in Eastern Europe? No, no such, no such, as I said, that the, those Eastern Euro European revolutions, Russian Revolution is the October Revolution, certain kind of moment, establish a new revolutionary government, a new state established. So very short. Very short. No painful and process. And many Eastern European countries, liber so-called liberated, quote, liberated by Soviet. When I was in Poland, a Polish intellectual said that, uh, well, the reform for us as an emancipation. So emancipation from where? From the gaze of big brothers. He said, uh, from the gaze that the Soviet, uh, the big brothers, there, so everything, so it's liberated. So that's why no such approach. This is the first. Second, only Communist Party, because it's a long revolution, they had the experience of the state, even during the revolutionary period. You know, the first Soviet state was established in 1931. Mao was the first chairman of that Jiangxi Soviet state. So the state needed to reorganize this society. And the responsible for everything, Mao said we need to be responsible for the production, agri-production, trade, and the birth rate, and the, the issue, even the family affairs between husband and wives, and how to treat their children, and all everything, the management. So these were part of the people's war. 
Very interesting. Even the Communist Party, that as early as 1931, issued their own currency. Yes. Central banking was yes. done, and yes. the first central banker was a great, was a student of Tsinghua University Economics Department. He didn't finish yes. his degree. Only yes. one year of training at Tsinghua University. Then he became central banker of the Communist Party. Uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway. Yes, and also you know that uh, uh, during the early reform period. One of the high-rank officials for the Chinese reform, who paid a visit to Chicago, he was the communist during the Civil War, uh, and actually the the, the resistance war against Japan.、Uh, you know that、uh, he was responsible for the financial policy. So at that time, already familiar with the markets. During the revolutionary era,、mm-hmm. so because there, the the whole certain kind of the structure of the government and state already shaped during the war time. So this is a long revolution. Very good. May、yeah. I also add、uh, the issue of Vietnamese Communist Party?、Yes. How would you compare Mao Zedong's Communist Party with Ho Chi Minh's Communist Party in Vietnam and implications for reforms in these two countries? Yeah, they actually the、uh, you know that the Hu Jintao spent a lot of time in China, and、uh, they worked together. So the Vietnamese War, there was certain kind of the color of Chinese Revolution, huge impact on that. Certain kind of the land revolution, the mobilization of peasants, and、uh, they directly took the idea of People's War、mm-hmm. from China. They they used that.、Mm-hmm. So Vietnamese War. At that time, are、uh, very different from others. So it's very different. Korean War, maybe the earlier Korean War, was too short. They tried to used the idea of People's War, especially the land reform in the north side, but it's too short.、Mm. Chinese great, you know, the the whole Chinese Revolution, as I said, even the war time, is from 1911 down to the 1949. Afterwards, the political revolution, cultural revolution, continues. So this is a huge mobilization,、mm. and for the peasants, I think it's very important because I had some experience in the countryside and the factories. You found that period, the certain kind of political consciousness for that generations, the、uh, peasants and the workers are very different because they were able to organize themselves. In the、uh, production and the political campaigns, so this is a quite a imp- the, compared to the other communist moment. These were very different experiences. Would you say that the Vietnamese Communist Party, in comparison with the Communist Party of China, is less centralized because Ho Chi Minh died too early, and Ho Chi Minh spent too many years in comparison with Mao Zedong in Western countries. So it's more. Scholastic, right? Like a scholar, Mao is much more pragmatic. Therefore, the Communist Party in Vietnam is much less、yes. capable and centralized than the Chinese Communist Party today. I, my knowledge about Vietnam was not good enough, I think. But anyway, I think you are right. At the same time, I guess, well, because Vietnam, Vietnam was a colony. A colony.、Mm. Almost as a full colony, colony. at that time.、Yeah. So Chinese、uh, situation is a little bit different because China, of course,、uh, so-called semi-colonized, but never been, never been fully colonized. So、mm. always maintain a certain kind of the political subjectivity. Hypothetical context. Hypothetically, yeah. If Zhou Enlai had Zhou Enlai been the Head、Leader. of Communist Party、yes. for many many years. Maybe the Communist Party of China is like the Vietnamese Communist Party. Maybe just historic. What do you think?、This、Very possible.、Fun. He、is. was from France and Germany. He studied there, and also from gentry pre- pre- background.、Mm-hmm. Not like uh, uh, not like a Mao from I- inland and a peasant family.、Mm-hmm. Yes. Wonderful. Second、yeah. question. The Cultural Revolution.、Yes. You mentioned that、yeah. uh, the Cultural Revolution does have a legacy、yeah. in educating the current generation of leaders in Xi Jinping and Li Keqiang. Yes. 
who spend their youth yes. years in the yes. countryside, and yes. therefore they can relate to the experience of yeah. grassroots, right? Yeah. Now, what other impact of the Cultural Revolution on today's reform in China? Yeah. I think that the, the first, the first is for the older generation, Deng Xiaoping's generation, Chen Yun's generation. During the Cultural Revolution, there were at least two levels. The one level, I think that they have the close contact with the lower social strata, with the lower reality, because they were sent to the really bottom of the society, the factories, countrysides, they worked together with the workers and peasants, became the friends of them. They remained at a high post so many years, but suddenly down to the earth. So that gives them capacity to make the response mm. to the demands of the lower social strata. That's why they can launch the reform in order to respond to the demands of the... It's not that they only came from their mind. They really came from the responses to the demand of the society. So this is a reform, the beginning of the reform. This one, the one issue. Second, that process also reduced, reduced the, the level of the uh, bureaucratization. Mm -hmm. That made the whole Chinese political system more flexible. Right. It's a, much more open for the different opinions at the beginning at the end of the Cultural Revolution and at the beginning of the reform, that opened the whole system, party system, that launched the, the, uh, the campaign for the liberation of thinking, right? Mm. So that will give the different opinions, the possibilities of different opinions. This is the second. Third one, I think that uh, they summarized some lessons from the early period, both in Mao's time and the early times. As I said, the lying struggle was the phenomenon. On the one hand, the line struggle for me is not only the power struggle, it's a political struggle because of different political lines. And in the socialist period, those line struggle always linked to the economic policies. You see that uh, Liu Shaoqi, uh, Deng Zihui, uh, their policy on agriculture was very different from Mao and others. So these were the line struggles. However, because of a lack of the uh, democratic mechanism, the line struggle could be uh, brutal, quite brutal sometimes. So how to reestablish a kind of mechanism within the party to manage that process? Mm. For example, succession issues mm. Mm. were gradually reshaped. I think mm. that up to now, not, not fully come, uh, the, the finished, but still, you can find the, the, uh, you can find the process from there, too. And at the same time, the, uh, the, the good or uh, bad, as you said, that on the one hand, try to avoid the extremes, extreme left, extreme right, try to maintain more in a practical way to, to keep the balance between, in between to launch the reform, not go to the extremes. So this is one lesson. Mm -hmm. But on the other lessons, I think it's the focus on the practice, highly emphasize the importance of the practice. Mao himself is em emphasized the importance of practice, but on the other hand, sometimes he seemed that uh, emphasize the importance of value, his political position and the values and so on and so forth. Okay. Ideology, yes. Yeah. Then was much more pragmatic in, in a sense. It yeah. also came from the result of mm. uh, his thinking about cultural revolution. Would you say that the cultural revolution helped Deng Xiaoping to create a consensus that is without reform, Communist Party and China will be doomed? That, yes. Would you say that? Yes, I think so. Okay. That was consensus. Otherwise, it's difficult to un because we know that in the late 70s and early 80s, between uh, Deng Xiaoping and uh, Chen Yun, together with others, there are a lot of the different views and opinions, but basic consensus was there. Mm. Too, Wonderful. Yes. Uh, one other implication of Cultural Revolution, Mao was very grateful to African countries. We know that. Yes. 
because China's return, yes. mainland China's return to, yes. to the UN yes. was uh, based upon support yes. from yeah. African countries. What is the implication for today's leaders? Are they picking up Mao's preference or Mao's, Mao's thinking on this issue? Obviously, uh, these, especially last years, uh, the Chinese government, the Communist Party, actually tried to, uh, they re-employ some ideas and uh, slogans from that period. But the connotation, mm. the content of that, the substance, there's a substance of that relations uh, transformed. Uh, if you read the, uh, the uh, uh, China-African forum, the statement, the first statement is 2001. Uh, from the beginning, they also, they try to use that, the early slogans in that statement too. And this year, uh, the, because of the 60 years anniversary of Bandung Conference, uh, Chinese government, together with other governments, Indonesia will hold a huge, it's a big, quite a big event for, for, for this the anniversary. And also inside of China, I know that uh, there were a lot of the discussions and the conferences for this 60 years anniversary of the Bandung Conference, which means that uh, they emphasize the solidarity between China and uh, like uh, BRIC countries, third world ca African countries, uh, uh, Latin American countries. It's certain kind of the shift only focus on the Sino-American relations, shift to these, reshift to these sides, but obviously the substance transformed. Okay, final question, which is a tricky question, but I would uh, urge you to give simple answers. I know it's, it's difficult to give simple answers. That is, what's the likelihood for China's politics and society to go through a relatively smooth evolution like yeah. the UK evolution, rather than going through bloody revolutions yes. again, yeah. like the French revolution. Yeah. What's your assessment for the future? I think that the, uh, since 1949, the Chinese way, in different ways, of course, sometimes radical, sometimes more or less mild, let's say. It's, uh, but basically, the, the, the basic trend was trying to find the internal forces to renew our system rather than replace the system with other, adopt the other things, which means that the, avoid the radical change of the structural change, but more emphasize the substance of the transformation. Sometimes we say that the political structure remains unchanged, but if you look at the content, the substance already transformed this, it's substantially already there. So, but the, the crucial issue is that whether or not we can find the political forces from within for the reform itself, not only something happened outside, only outside to, I mean, the crackdown, the whole system, and the, this kind of the revolution. So. Internal revolution, certain kind of the or the subjective revolution was uh, the way you can argue that the reform is a revolution. This is also Deng Xiaoping's idea. He said that the re when he said that the reform is a revolution, which means that uh, substantially speaking, reform transformed everything, but not took the form of the radical bloody revolution. I think this is the, the, uh, the, the I th still, uh, to, after now, I still, uh, let's say, confident for the, to, to some extent, confident for this, still. Confident that China will not go through another French Revolution style, bloody movements. Correct? I think that kind of the time already passed. Also, Maybe, yeah, for China. Also, it's, the yeah. 1989 style movement in different scale, in different scale, still possible. But in different scale, it's still possible. Bigger scale, lower scale. Uh, I think it's a lower scale. Lower scale. But the, but the social scale could be big. But you know that the 1989. If you want to understand the 1989, 
1989, of course, there were a lot of the economic issues, social issues, mainly because the internal conflicts of the political structure. Without that different, the, the power struggle within the system, it's very difficult to, to, to understand. Within the party specifically? Yes, obviously. Without that, it's not possible to have a national mobilization. For example, is a, the, how can the party use the CCTV People's Daily, Guangming Daily to mobilize the whole society against right. itself? Very so, good insights. So these were, these, it's not possible without mm -hmm. the, the internal, so these were the, the issue. And then how can maintain a political stability in that sense mm -hmm. were very important, I think. Thank yeah. you very much. Mm -hmm.